You are listening to the CEO Warrior Podcast. The CEO Warrior is the highest level training and coaching organization for quick, scalable business growth. In this podcast, you'll learn how to get more wealth, freedom, and market domination. And now, your host, he's the co-owner of CEO Warrior. He's the co-founder of the Service Business Edge event. He's a published author and a popular speaker. Here's business warrior, Mike Aguilero. So first, why don't you give everybody a snapshot, a little bit about your background. Some know you. Who who saw uh, Jay speak here before? Raise your hand if you did. Okay, so it's nice to see you're back again. Who has never read anything from Jay or watched any videos or anything? Raise your hand if you don't know much. Okay, thanks for your honesty. That's good. This way, he knows what to tell you about himself. So give a little bit of your background. Uh, okay. So for the better part of four decades, I've been in the business of growing businesses through a multitude of different uh, uh, processes. One, strategy alterations or moving people from being tactical to strategic to uh, multiplying the, the, the power and the impact and the, and the, uh, uh, the predominance of their marketing. Three, changing their business model for uh, creating for them networks of uh, strategic alliances, partners, five, developing massive referral uh, systems, a lot of things. But, but probably what's interesting to you is I've done about a thousand industries, not businesses, and I've done them around the world. And when you do that many, you're introduced to thousands of different strategic forms of thinking, thousands of different business models, thousands of different what you call access vehicles, different ways to reach the market, thousands of different ways to create superior value. And I've been able to take combinations and combine them into hybrids that people who spend their life in one or two industries where everybody does the same thing about the same way can gain um, surprisingly rapid advantage. And I'm just being clinical because he wants me to give you the the shtick. So uh, let's see. Over the years, I've helped. You guys are mostly uh, younger than I am. I've helped uh, 300 of the top experts. I've helped Success Magazine. I was in the embryonic stages of Entrepreneur Magazine. I was in the embryonic stages of a product, Icy Hot. I'm the only person, I'm just telling this clinically, that Tony Robbins does a full day with with his um, his uh, platinum partners, and he's got now, a, believe it or not, a $120,000 group called Lions, and we do a full day together of problem solving back and forth, uh, and he lets me lead it, which is nice. I, uh, I counsel Damon John from Shark Tank, I counsel... Uh, some of you might know who Dave Asprey is with Bulletproof Coffee. Uh, I forget all the people I counsel. I have a very broad spectrum of people that I counsel. I've got two different clients that do very high-level uh, stuff for the Navy, one uh, for the military. One does scenario-based based training for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, which used to be on the ground type things. Now it's really how do we knock out the infrastructure, the telephone lines, the you know the roads, the the, the ports, the airports. The other um, is uh, provides the test pilots for the Navy for all the new planes and the actual drone pilots. There's two kinds of drones, ones that take pictures and ones that can shoot bullets and drop bombs and they do the latter and I do a lot of very diverse clients around the world I'm leaving here going home going to Beijing for a two-day meeting going to Vietnam where I'm keynoting to 5,000 people I don't do a lot of of uh, uh, seminars anymore but I do keynotes for very complex type people and my life is spent solving problems um, m mining opportunities, untapped opportunities, figuring out how to make activities you're doing perform better or replacing, enhancing them. And I've uh, done uh, a lot of work definitively on both 
what's called the strategy of preeminence and the advanced strategy of preeminence, which is a way of elevating your company and its culture and its people to the position of the only viable source somebody can choose. And I'm known uh, pretty well worldwide for knowing how to work on the geom internal geometry of a business, which means that your revenue system has maybe 50 impact points in it that you don't know, each one of which can often be made to perform 10 to 20 percent better and 10 or 20 percent in one element, whether it's targeting, whether it's attracting, whether it's converting, whether it's upselling, whether it's sustaining, the cumulative effect of many of those is hundreds of percent increase in your profit. And we have this matter of, of uh, track record, we have about $21 billion uh, worldwide that confirms this. We've done leading companies in two or three industries in China, in Japan, uh, and I'm very eclectic. I don't do one industry, and I'm probably more than anything, uh, as far as defining what I what I am. I think I'm a more than anything a masterful thinking partner who has a enormous amount of empirical understanding. But I can't manage my way out of a paper bag. Okay, very very good. And for you guys, if some of you uh, are having a hard time hearing it all, just pull yourself up here, like. And I talk soft sometimes. Move seat, so make sure you can hear or. Or tell you know, me. Yeah. I'll talk louder. Yeah. Uh, so, I was thinking what would be cool, and and I had a whole bunch of questions, which I normally do, but I'm going to change it in the midst of things. Is, it's going to be about struggle. Okay. So why do you think? Because in in our world, at CEO Warrior, uh, well, these guys are coming here. Everybody's coming here because they have a pain of some kind or they want more pleasure of some kind. But it seems like they're in this rat race where they feel, Jay, you know, I, I, and you guys tell me if I'm right or wrong. It's almost like you feel the industry is the problem, right? It's the, uh, I hear it over and over, like it's the, it's the, uh, customers the problem, they're cheap. Uh, where I live is the problem, there's not enough people. Um, everything is the problem except probably what the real problem is. So why don't you just talk about solving struggles and problems within a personal or business world? Well, I don't think you can really uh, achieve what I'll call optimum success, and you have to define it, but if you're gonna run a business, you gotta decide ahead of time what you want that to me because so many people really don't run a business a business they're they are hopefully decently paid employees of a job that they happen to own <laughs> they've built nothing viable it has no net worth they end up half the time having to be the technician be when somebody doesn't show or does a bad job or is sick or some other uh, problem and they end up working a lifetime for an income, and at the end of it, they have accomplished nothing that gives them stability, security, wealth, certainty. I think you have to start in the beginning by saying, what do I want it to look like and why? For me and the clients that I help, I start by saying, okay, here's what we want. We want a enterprise that will work harder and harder for you than you work for it. Not that you're lazy, but because you understand going in the meaning of business life. And the meaning of business life starts with the ability to create greater value and benefit to all the critical recipients who need it. First ones obviously are the consumers. Second one are the people that work for you. Third one are the vendors. You need them all in your eco or ecosystem to make it work. But if you're gonna build a life, you gotta decide what do you want the business to be? You want it to be a constant stress case that is up and down where you're struggling to make payroll and you're paying everybody but yourself and you can't keep good people. If that That's what a lot of people abdicate to, but you have to realize that you either control your situation or your situation controls you. You're either a victim or a victor, and it's not really as daunting, it's just that most people never learn from anyone who can explain it. I have not been asked to do this 
for a long time, so I'll do a very fragmented job of explaining it. And then if you want me to reflect on it and try tomorrow, I'll try again. But let's start with a business that works for you. Okay, how's it gonna work for you? Well, you need, first of all, some components. You need to understand sustainable marketing that creates five different factors. One, continually predictable, current, profitable income. And profitable income can be one step or two. It might be you need a lead that doesn't make money, but a process that upgrades it within a reasonable time ethically. And we're assuming we're all doing this ethically with great uh, integrity. Number two, you need a system that predictably creates sustainable future income. So it's not erratic and episodic. Number three, you need the ability to identify continuously what I call opportunistic income and different convergent factors happen all the time that if you are monitoring and aware and know how to proactively respond, those are the big hits, the couple hundred thousand dollar deals, and they do exist, but you need to be able to know how to, uh, how to uh, gain preemptive access and how to basically own them. Then you need, uh, you need psychic wealth. You need to have your system, your business set up so that one of the biggest uh, wealth creation factors is not economic compensation, it's, it's your, your, the joy, the certainty, the pride that you have knowing that you're helping families, homes function better, you're knowing that you're giving uh, greater opportunity and fulfillment to your technicians and your team, knowing that in a you know, pathetically funny way, you're helping manufacturers stay alive and be successful. And, and you have to have this integrative attitude. Now, so you need marketing that is going to be optimal. Most people aren't even trained in marketing. Uh, they run ads or emails or none of the above. They don't know uh, how to forge them so that they will be focused on the optimal benefit to the consumer. They don't know how to measure them. No one tells you that one approach can easily outproduce another by orders of magnitude. Different kinds of approaches will produce either more leads or more conversions or higher tickets. You need to know which ones do which so you can have a blend. How many in this room can honestly say in this exercise, if it works right, will be the most embarrassingly inspiring that I will do. How many people in this room can honestly say that you can take a pick 60 to 80 or more percent of your business comes from word of mouth or from referral? Stand up. Remain standing if you have in place right now at least one systematic, strategic, well-codified, ongoing, referral-generating system that you and the entire uh, organization applies all the time when appropriate. If you have at least one, remain standing. Okay, great. Two. Do you, you have one? One. Two? No. Sit down. <laughs> now, most of you, if I'd lowered the percentage to 30%, how many would have stood up? 40%. Here's, here's the key. Uh, most of us spend money on external advertising that isn't really forged to understand the psychology of the need of the market for you to be seen as preemptive and preeminent. We spend almost no time effort on referral generation. Now let me explain what marketing really is externally and cold. It's the first outer periphery of trust building. So when you run a cold ad in Facebook or uh, a newspaper, you're getting somebody who's apprehensive, who's suspect, suspect, who's tentative. You have to work many stages to go from from uh, from what I would call uh, self-protective curiosity to open checkbook commitment. 
when you get a referral, they're there ready to buy. They don't negotiate much or at all. They normally buy more. They buy more things. They stay longer. They're more enjoyable to deal with. They do what they say. They pay when they say. They refer more people and they cost you nothing. And yet we spend all our time and effort on trust. And, and so they're already coming with 100% trust. But we spend all our time on 0% trust. Now, does that make sense? And we pay for that. We pay for the privilege. It's almost uh, masochistic if you think about it, isn't it? So you need to know marketing and what it's designed to do. It has to be congruent to what your positioning is. You need, there's nine drivers. I got all these things that I created I can never remember anymore. But there's nine drivers of a business that will produce exponential growth. First thing is you change your marketing, you change your result. Second thing, you change your strategy, you change your result. I normally can give you a lot of uh, examples, but my mind is, uh, is going to have to access them. Maybe I'll think tomorrow. You change your ideology, you change your result. Your ideology may be that I'm trying to hit and run, meaning sell somebody right now and move on, as opposed to I'm going to nourish and gestate people through a system that's going to be perpetual. You, you change the way you use relationships. Relationships means referrals. Relationships means other organizations that have the same profile who can partner with you. Relationships mean uh, things you can do to gain access to affinity groups that are high profile, uh, partnering with everybody from builders that know that their developments are now in time for be replaced. I mean, all kinds of things that no one else thinks about. And I'm just giving you a few shots. Okay, uh, processes and procedures. Wherever there is variation or worse, there is no systemization, there is uh, slippage. And if you have more than one person doing the same thing, you're going to have variation if you don't have a system that they have to adhere to. Same thing with selling. Uh, if you look at, if you have many people selling for you, you're going to find that some are better at selling uh, the inexpensive start, some are better at, uh, at upgrading them, some are better at coming in and and selling a whole system, but everyone's not going to be the same. Your job is to get unification if you can, and if you can't, to bring in specialists to do what they do best. For example, somebody may sell the $29 loss leader repair but can't upgrade, but they can sell that all day long, and somebody else may be able to come in with them and sell the $5,000, um, you know, whatever replacement that they need genuinely because of authenticity. You need uh, multiple, multiple. we call it um, a power parthenon. Um, if you can envision, because I don't really, oh, there's a board up there. I, I don't want to do it. If you can envision a, a diving board, that's what most businesses look like to me. The board is your revenue. The uh, Think about one, in a, oh, you know, where they knocked down a tree and they used a, uh, part of a tree and a board a plank. The plank's your revenue. The the stump is your one driver that you're using that you're dependent on. If anything happens to that, you're screwed and anything could happen. One of your employees could leave, be hired away. Uh, uh, the algorithms could change at Facebook and you get your, your response can cut in half. Uh, the recirculation of a newspaper drops another 50% or the raisin rates. Everything is terrible. I try to get my clients to have eight or nine separate, uh, uh, separate strategic access vehicles going on concurrently to impact, pervade, uh, uh, access the market from as many vantage points as possible. Anybody here military? No. One? A couple. Okay. Couple well, if you know from military, there's a concept called force multiplier effect. Do you know what that is? Anybody? Would you like to know what that is, anybody? I would, sir. Okay. <laughs> it's a concept that you have a target. Let's say we're in war. <clears throat> I'm the general of 
one country, you're the general of another. Well, what I'm going to do is identify maybe 10 different um, uh, attack modes that I'm going to deploy on you, either in an order or concurrently. And they might be, I might start with uh, knocking out your infrastructure, your phones, your your s supply lines, air airports, uh, roads, uh, shipping. Then I might uh, drop bombs. Then I might have surface to air or water to air missiles. Uh, then I might have drones come and attack key installations. And a lot, and then there's a series of others. But I, I'm doing it not really caring. There's some strategy to it, but I don't care which of those salvos knocks out and wins the war. I just care that one does. So if you're accessing your market from multitudes of places, you have three wonderful things going for you. One, you're reaching them in different access modes <clears throat> because there are a ton of people in life that have uh, that have expressed need but procrastinate or equivocate on taking action because the issue and the pain isn't made uh, significant or severe enough. Ask yourself this. What is it in your business life or your personal life that you know you need to fix but you haven't? That uh, my wife finally, after uh, two years of having, we have a big house with a lot of decks upstairs, of having uh, the house leak and having to repair the ceiling and not knowing, because you know leaks are nasty, they might come start here but end up there, she finally got them fixed. But uh, she had two years to do it, it's just the pain wasn't bad enough. But if you think in your life that you have a lot of things you, you need to do, want to do, have to do but don't do, it's you're a human being. So you have to make your issue powerful enough and uh, prominent and um, and priority enough. And it's, I mean, all this is within your control. Am I being too confusing? No, you're good. I'm just giving you a bunch of random thoughts to try to answer the question. You have to know how to do it and think about it. Uh, if you're not a sharpshooter, but your job was to be a uh, a sniper. I mean, and not and a, and a positive sniper for the good of saving the world. Do you think if you picked up a rifle and your job was to knock out uh, 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 an enemy sniper at uh, four thousand yards and you really weren't a good gunman, you would do it? No. But if you had a rifle, if you had a bazooka, if you had oh. uh, a, a walkie-talkie who could give give uh, uh, whatever they call the yeah, coordinates to a helicopter, what do you think the odds are then? Yeah. So you're trying to give yourself, here, here's the concept. Business is really simple. It's about a couple of things. One, it's about uh, providing greater advantage benefit contribution to the market that they value, that their definition and yours are in alignment than your competitor. It's about taking as much of the risk away from the transaction as possible. It's about having your entire organization from the person that answers the phone to the person that does the install, the tech support, takes out the trash, all being on an integrated mission where they all see their role as helping to make that client's life improved. It's about you realizing that you have three categories of clients that you must serve. The first is the ones that pay you, and the buyer. But the other two are the ones you pay. They're hitching their lives to your star. You may not understand it if you're a control-based, oblivious entrepreneur, which we can all be, but their lives are just as important. They look to you for fulfillment, purpose, uh, security, stability. Your, your goal is to uh, 
is to grow and develop them so that they feel more successful and they feel part of the process. And if they don't, then they feel disconnected and they can't be integral to the whole game plan. Your third client, believe it or not, are your vendors and and uh, your advisors. If you're better, if you're better to them than anybody else, you're going to get preferred access. You're going to get intelligence. You're going to get first access to products. You're going to get you're going to get knowledge when somebody's disgruntled at another place that you can hire. But it's an integrative game that you either play strategically or you play tactically back at the ranch. The other thing is advantage. There are, and I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, your goal in the macro sense is to put maximum aggregate ethical advantage and probability on your side of the T-square and move maximum disadvantage and ethical improbability on the competitor's side. And the only way you can do that is to, first of all, identify what the different gradients of advantage are. And that's a longer process that I'm just working through, but it's pretty exciting, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Let me get let me give a summary is, of something. Yeah, does this make sense? Or? Yeah, so you can yeah. take a, a drink and... Okay, thank so you. So I, I thought that, first off, <laughs> and I'm going to give you things so you can write it down so that you don't miss it. One of the things that Jay was just saying about the three different categories of clients... Um, the first part, most of you are paying attention to the client that's paying you, delivering the service. And then constantly what I hear is this recruiting problem. Well, there's a, you know, a lot of you want to hang your hat on, there's a de declining deficiency of people who want to do plumbing and HVAC. I don't subscribe to that because in 10 years we went from four employees to 200 employees. But when we were four, when we were four employees, I said the same thing you guys said. Well, there's nobody around and all the good people are taken and there's a deficiency. But then when I was 200, I was like, wow, there's no deficiency at all. There's a strategy that's missing, right? The other thing he said is, you know, the, the, so the people that pay you, the people that, that you pay them, your employees, and the third one, the vendors, which Aaron and I were just talking about yesterday. And it's funny you mentioned that, Jay, was with our <coughs> vendors, you know, we pay so much time. Who gets emails from CEO Warrior anyway? Raise your hand. Do you get a fair amount of emails or? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, well that's, I'm glad you giggled because, <laughs> yeah, one time somebody told me, I was, at, I was talking at a, a big convention and someone said to me, man, Mike, you send a lot of emails. And I said, yeah, but if it bothers you, just opt off the list. He goes, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do that. I said, how's business going for you? He said, well, it's a little rocky. I said, oh, I'm gonna use, a, well, you'll get used. Sometimes I curse, so if you don't like that, pray for me tonight, it's fine. I said, well, <laughs> why don't you send some more fucking emails, right? That's maybe why you're struggling. You're not keeping, keeping in, in touch. I think that's key. The other thing um, that Jay said was, you know, identify the why. Have any of you took the time to write down why and what this business needs to give you? Because if you don't have clarity, and I did this on a video for the Warriors the other day, I said, if you think you hate this business you're in, whatever you do, you'll eventually hate. Because you better love this until you're good at it, because otherwise, how are you going to get good at doing other things? You think, oh, well, I, I like, I'll do better at a fishing business because I love to fish. Chances are, if you haven't figured this out, you won't figure that out. The other thing he said is uh, you control your situation or it controls you. You know, it's like the economy. When we were going through the last economy that they looked at as, they said it was close to the Great Depression. Rob and I never had a down year in 10 years. I didn't subscribe to that because if you just think of this, and maybe write it down, because a lot of this, maybe you don't have solved, but what if you were the creator of your own economy? I always say this to people, you know how to not complain about, you know how it is. Some of you are like, man, the gallon of gas, Jay, costs so much money. I say, you want to know how not to complain about gallon of gas? Make more money. Because <laughs> people who make a lot of money don't complain about a dollar more of gas. They just learn how to make more money. So create your own uh, economy. The other thing is he said you're a victim or a victor. And I don't want you guys to miss this because Jay's going to go again. Okay, but I want it to sink in. I mean, how many, and, and none of you in this room, I realize, because you're here, but how many of you have family that every, every Thanksgiving, there's a victim in your family? Raise your hand if this, yeah, like I, I, I can't. If you don't have one, I can get you some. <laughs> yeah. That'd be I mean, a good service. 
Victims for rent. Yeah, I canceled Thanksgiving one year because you're two weeks before Thanksgiving. I told my mom, uh, unfortunately, my wife and I have canceled Thanksgiving. And she's like, is everything okay? I'm like, it's perfectly fine. I'm just going to do it with my own family this year. You know, because I just didn't want any. Now, some of you are like, no, you'll go there, eat the turkey, listen to your, your uh, you know, stepmothers or whatever's garbage. And, and then you'll go home and, you know, the under the table kick, yep. right? You'll kick them. It's time to leave. And then you, the ride home, you talk about them the whole time. I figured, well, that's such a waste of time. We just won't do that. And I'll just enjoy my, my family. Sustainable marketing. I mean, I get it. Your marketing today is what someone is selling you, and you're putting, a lot of you are putting your life in them. Here's my pay-per-click money. But you don't even understand some of the concepts, and you're mad it's not working, but you don't even understand the complexities on how fast Google's changing and Facebook is changing. And I'm not telling you to master it. I'm telling you not to be illiterate to some of it. Does that make sense? If you're illiterate, there's going to be pain. Can I interrupt? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm very blessed or cursed. I do, I don't, I'm not a one category person, quite the opposite. And I have all kinds of diverse people. And last week, one of my clients, which is uh, the U.S. The US uh, division of the largest cosmetic surgery group in the world, and I helped them grow in Japan, so it's sort of cool, and now they're in the United States. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to do uh, cable ads because they're in one little niche. Mm -hmm. And they went, and they, they on their own, they asked the cable rep to help them, and the cable rep gave them an ad to run. And they came to me and they said, what do you think? And I said, where are the other ads? And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, are they omnipotent enough to know that this is the winning ad? Huh. You've got to understand that, that the greatest gift you have in marketing is uh, the court of last resorts, the consumer. But you can't, it's, it's, and I'm saying this about uh, self-anointed experts. Mm -hmm. All these SEO, all these people, they... Um, They'll come up with a, a couple of things, unless they're really good, and you're not testing one thing against another. You're not testing one proposition against another. There, it, when you get into variability, you will find that uh, there are different ways of doing things with very different outcomes. You can change a headline and double or triple or quintuple an ad. You can change the way you greet somebody on the phone and have an impact. You can change the way you start a conversation at the door. You can change the proposition. You can change the proof element. But it's very rare that anybody is uh, uh, gifted enough that they can do it on the first one. So I made these people create three different ones and not try to be omnipotent, the market will always tell you by either their lack or their, or their enthusiastic response. And they will vote with their phone calls, their checkbooks, their credit cards. You, uh, a lot of these self-anointed experts are, uh, and I'll give you a very great example that I was one of them once and I have great remorse. They are so dangerous to your wealth, it's unbelievable because their heart is well intended, but their understanding of strategic marketing and of the human condition is limited. One of my very first jobs is that I work for a very, very, a very popular radio station in Indianapolis. And my job was to call on the people that didn't have an ad agency. And I was very compelling, and I would get a lot of people who'd never run ads to allow us to do a flight, do $3,000. And we had in our station a man whose claim to fame and pride was that he could run, he could write a 60 second commercial in 60 <coughs> seconds. The only problem was they didn't work. <laughs> and they would never try one spot against another rotate. Yeah. And, and I'm saying there's a lot of things that no one's ever taught you. Now, I have to say something in behalf of Mike. And I'm here because I believe in Mike 
because I don't like cold weather. And I live in a very luxurious spot in California. And I have all the accoutrements, a pool, a jacuzzi, a steam room, people that come over and bring me my, my stuff. I don't have to leave. And, and I, I'm cold. I'm cold here. But here's the deal. He does good because he makes you grapple with the realities and a reality check on all that you don't grasp. One of the things I tell people, and I was telling Mike, if you, if you have a business that is underperforming, first thing you have to know is that it's underperforming. And you can't know that if you don't know how much more is possible from time, effort, media, uh, communication, interaction, uh, prospects, closed first-time buyers, second-time buyers, referrals. And if you don't know the possibilities, there's no way you can access the possibilities. But there's a concept called optimization highest and best use of everything and everybody. And let me give you the first mistake most people make. 90% of entrepreneurs get about 20% of the, of the realistic capability that their team members have the capacity to produce. Why? Three reasons. Number one, they don't know how to train them. When I ask people, do you train your people in either, uh, 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 do you train your people? Yes, but then I go more granular. Do you train them in consultative selling? Everybody in your organization that has any interaction with the public should be, should be trained in that from your receptionist, your technician, your, your accounts receivable, your delivery, uh, your internal, customer service do you do you teach people uh, uh, listening skills do you teach people uh, ask how to ask good questions and hear them do you teach your people how to gain proficiency in time management do you teach people how to collaboratively be coaches and um, and uh, catalysts to enhance each person when I ask them if they teach them how to, to, to sell, they say yes, but all they're really teaching them is whatever selling modality they have. They're teaching them their product, their service. They're not teaching them how to be better salespeople. They're not teaching them how to be more authentic. Now, this will scare you, but there are soft skills that are out there that'll blow your mind. Stephen M. R. Covey is the master in the world at understanding business trust building. And if you master or your team masters business trust building, there are very well-documented clinical data that it gives you a 300% increase in, in uh, receptivity, in closures, in dollars, and also in internal uh, performance and trust, meaning they don't fight you on things. They are much more collaborative. Uh, do you share openly your vision, your struggle from the beginning, your, your goal with everybody? When you say, I can't hire good people, that is so bullshit, it's that you won't. And there's two different ways to do Well, most people won't hire good people or trainable people. One of the, one of the greatest lessons I ever heard, and you've got to bite the bullet if you're going to as ascribe to this, is hire the best and cry only once. Which means pay them what they're worth because if you hire the worst, you're gonna cry every time. The next is if you can't afford to hire the best, hire the best trainable and invest in growing and developing them because you'll create your own talent that'll be loyal. Yeah. And if you do that, pay them what they're worth as they develop. Yeah. Don't exploit them negatively. I can go on and on. Does this yeah, help? yeah. And I think what he just said there is so key. Like, well, uh, Joe Williams, where's Joe Williams and Allison's in the room in the back? You guys will meet them. Uh, Joe runs a uh, a company to teach people how to 
speak better, communicate their message. I mean, he's worked with the top in the world. And what Jay just said made so much sense. We just spent, my whole team, well, uh, our master advisors just spent two days honing our speaking skills. Yes, through Saturday and Sunday. And the fact is that Gold Medal, even though we had 200 employees, any one of them, Mike Disney, who you'll spend more time with, any one of them could have went to any company. Who's from New Jersey, anybody? Okay, any one of my people, you could have paid more and, and you were confused why they wouldn't leave if you tried to hire someone. What do you mean? I'm gonna pay you $5 more, why won't you leave? There's normally a key underlining thing. You're not Mike, you're not Rob. You don't run a company like that. These guys fight for our livelihood every single day. I go to war with them. And that's why even today, I have loyalty from a company that I sold. So it's so key what he's saying there. The other thing that he talked about with you know, this, this testing, you, know, you guys are putting, like I would ask my pay-per-click company, my SEO company, my whatever uh, cost per lead company, uh, billboard company, what do we gotta do to test it to squeeze the lemon? And if they're just doing a one and done for you guys, you're, you're out, right? You're shaking your head, you're like, yeah. Like if they're not constantly testing a headline, a color, an offer, that is, I, I don't want Jay to run past that on you because he's, he's, he's giving you right now millions of dollars of value. Just some of you may not be there yet to grab it, so I want to kind of pull it down. You have to go back and ask these questions. What's the one word? You know, everybody wants to get that. Uh, we had it too. It's a better than great day, a gold medal, plumbing, heating, cooling, and electric. How may I serve you today? Right, but the fact is, what if changing one thing on that ramped up conversion? Yeah. And that's what Jay is talking about right there. And one, one last thing before I give it back to Jay is, you know, highest and best use. I want you to just think of that word, highest and best use. Highest and best use of your time. Who's pretty sure in this room, be honest, including myself, is not doing it good enough, highest and best use of their time? Yeah, you're ordering parts when there's someone for $6 an hour that could do it. You're like, no, it's a real technical thing. It's like, really, you think so? I'm pretty sure I can Google that shit and it comes up. Like, you know, because when it was encyclopedia stuff, it yeah. was technical. You had to go and hope it was in a book. Today I picked this up. I don't even have to touch it anymore. I could talk to it and say, tell me how to operate on a heart. So highest and best use is so important for you guys to hear what Jay is saying here, because if you could just say to yourself, I should be doing this instead of that, the game will change. The game will change. Is this making sense for you guys what you're hearing? I want to see nods from everybody. And I know, look, we're going to stretch you. I'm so excited, Jay, because these are, these are our high level of clients. These are guys that invested in VIP, invested Great. in Titan. I'm Great. honored for that. I'm a guy, well, you could see Jay's my coach and I'm going to get, I'm gonna give them two things you helped me with. Would that Please. be cool? Sure. Okay, all right. You know, I'm a believer in investing and being in the room with people who want to invest, but it's not the investment. It's the investment is the ability, your willingness to play at that level. I wanna give you two things I wrote down before, because Jay, just so you know about, when were we together when uh, Joe was there, me, you, Rob, four oh. years ago? Yeah, about. About four years ago. And we were gonna spend four hours with Jay. He burnt me out in two and a half, and he was so kind. He said, at this point, normally, people are whatever he said, but I was mush. I was like, I'm done. What I learned from that is even though I was done, he stretched me the balloon. But when you stretch a balloon and it comes back, is it smaller or bigger? It's bigger. It's bigger. So don't be, don't be like, holy crap, Jay's saying words, I don't know, Mike is talking fast. You're, you're stretching, and that's good. Number two, and I want you to write this down now. Jay told me and Rob, and this was, a, this was a critical point for us in exiting our company. And this is probably only two and a half years ago, Brian's or son. Because okay. I went and saw Jay, we were talking, and he goes, Jay's so kind, right? He's like, you, 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 you and Rob, you gotta fix the profit here. However he said, you gotta fix the profit. Like, because people, what are you gonna do? Sell a dog someday? I'm giving my words, not Jay's. We focused on profit. Now, we did double digits in the beginning, but when you start doing 25, 28 million, do you have to be good to do double digits, guys? Well, a lot of you aren't at 25 or 28 million, but you gotta be good to do double digits. When he said that, and a bunch of strategies, we'll talk some over today, or Jay will share it tomorrow. 
we went to double digit profits in a year. So there was no confusion why a $40 billion company wanted to come in and own us, but fight to get us is because, but it was only the thing I heard something from Jay in a way I wasn't either, didn't hear it before, wasn't ready to hear it, and it stuck. We must focus on profit and maximizing it. And whatever you give attention on, it grows, doesn't it? Whatever you put focus on grows, good or bad. If you put focus on, you know, uh, I just focus on fat and fat and fat and fat, well, you might just stay fat. You know, if you focus on the solution, then you're gonna, you're gonna get healthier. Does that make sense, some of the stuff? Absolutely. May I say a couple of things that'll excite you? So, this is true. I could give you, and tomorrow maybe I will, I just, I, I, I never know what Mike wants me to do, which I enjoy, <laughs> because I can be very free form, but it might be a little bit uh, disgrunt, just disgruntled, but just uh, oriented for you. We tested one time 33 different ways of greeting somebody at a front door of a large furniture company. Wow. And one of them tripled closures. And I'll tell you what it is, so you don't have to uh, uh, guess. It wasn't what you would think. It wasn't, can we help you, or it's a great day. Uh, it was, and what ad brought you into the store today? And we just, we, we tested it, and we realized when it won three times more, same number of leads, same amount of, of advertising, no change in the ad, was that it moved control and leadership back to the salesperson. Yeah. You couldn't say, well, you have to say the Italian bedroom set. Oh, is the rest of your house Italian? Is it a new house? Is it, uh, you know, is it uh, to replace something else? What are your tastes? And they got authoritative leadership. That was one thing I was going to say. The second thing is, Optimization, highest and best use, is a wonderful concept. Lamentably, you can't optimize until you at least have a context of not all, but a broader spectrum of options, opportunities, uh, alternatives, and possibilities available, and the ability to judge them on different performance criteria. I've had many companies that I manage where we had multiple optimization theories. One would be that we had certain things that were designed to bring entry level people in. And they were going to be at best break even, oftentimes short term cash flow loss leaders. But concurrently, we would have other marketing that would be selling specific high ticket products because we needed to balance out our cash flow. Other times we would have just straightforward service. But it's, it, it, you, you have free will. Yeah. <laughs> You're not, there's no law that says if you do more than one thing and you have multiple, <clears throat> multiple uh, 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 not goals, but multiple initiatives you're, you're pursuing concurrently, you're going to be arrested and taken to the multi-marketers uh, jail and, <laughs> and charged with being too successful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So think about that. What yeah. do you want else me to talk So why don't we talk a little bit about, uh, if we could go on a little higher level and talk about wealth a little bit, wealth strategies, because for a lot of our industries in, and I mean, we do more than just service industries, but today we do do everything from plumbing, HVAC, we got Andrew has the top dog training uh, facility and also trains dog trainers. Really? Yeah. And, and Mary and Gary up here, they run a, a very, very great business and they run Outbound 360, a lot of the stuff you're going to hear about. But I want people to start thinking wealth more. Because if you can understand that your service business could be one aspect or the aspect of wealth, and you could just, maybe you deserve it, maybe you don't think you deserve wealth, or maybe you don't believe you could have it. So if you could just talk about the concept of wealth. Okay. Uh, I'll give you an, I'm not, I was born uh, Jewish, I'm not terribly devout. But one of my colleagues, um, Paul Pilzer, who's an uh, economist, wrote a book a couple of years ago called God Wants You to Be Rich. Oh. And his concept was that you can't 
touch enough people unless you have the resources. You can't make the world better unless you get all you can. So uh, it assumes a couple of, uh, the a pre-assumption is that you have an ethos, uh, an ideology, a, uh, uh, a uh, moral compass that is predicated on wanting to make the world better in different ways. And the first way is, you know, right in your own life. Uh, greatness is a function of not just being a good entrepreneur, not just being a good leader, not just being a good uh, 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 stimulator, grower, developer of talent, but being a good husband, being a good contributor to your environment, being somebody who wants to leave the world better off because you were here as opposed to just siphon oxygen out and leave the world with more, uh, more CO2. But if you talk about wealth creation, there's active and there is passive there is uh, there's many ways to create it. And I'll just walk you through what people do, but I want to caution that they the, the, the smartest ones do it in um, in in transactional tranches. They don't overextend themselves. They don't take on more diffused management than they're capable of they think it through very pragmatically and they are good critical and consequential thinkers meaning they're thinking through probability outcome and they're not in a hurry they move slower so they can go faster when everything is in place but there's many strategies strategy one is you take what you've done you codify it and you use it to acquire other organizations in your area or outside and acquiring them if they have a good reputation but they underperform is a lot easier yeah. than starting from scratch, I believe. Uh, but it, you have to have a certain uh, criteria of factors in place. If they've got a bad culture, then it doesn't matter if they have a good reputation because Changing the culture is a nightmare. If they're already in alignment, but they're not very ambitious and they don't do good marketing and they don't have good strategy and they're losing ground, uh, it could be great. The next is figure things that occur before, during, and after people use your services and either own or start those for three reasons. They are uh, in alignment. They're also feeders of one another or leads. The next is obviously live below your, but first of all, I was gonna make this point before I left. Your role, your job, your primary uh, purpose, and there's another book you might uh, have them read, but uh, you'd have to print it up because we don't have any hard copies. We publish it ourselves. It's called The CEO Who Can See Around Corners. Have you ever seen it? Mm -hmm. And it talks about basically six, Areas. It's a collaboration I did with somebody much brighter than I, but it's very deep. But it talks about your role is to be the strategist, not the tactician, not worry about the lights being on, but set the stage. Your, your, your need is to grasp and, man, and, and master hindsight, insight, foresight, so you can get a context of what has happened historically in the lessons, if they're still viable what's happening right now and the implications, what looks like it's gonna happen in the future and the opportunities or the dangers so you're not caught off guard and you're always basically uh, proactive in everything you're doing. When you make money, and I'll tell you very honestly, I've made for myself probably hundreds of millions of dollars. I am not a pauper. But I was more fascinated in helping grow businesses and getting great big fat fees. And I didn't invest in passive real estate. This weekend, last weekend I was in Austin and I was the keynote. People bring me in to solve complex problems. And I was the keynote problem solver for a very small group, 25 of the top 
home flippers in the country. The average one does 250 to 500 homes a year. And these are usually, uh, the majority were 40, 50, and they're making about $10 million. But they're realizing that it's ordinary income. Once they get the big house and the cars, they're all starting now to get the house under market, bring in investors, and not flip them, but own them and and manage them. And the ones that impressed the heck out of me had 1,600 or 2,500 homes that were throwing off positive cash flow, were appreciating, and were working hard for them. Most of them had third-party management. But I think, it, I mean, it. I don't like minority interest in most things because unless the business is sold, you don't have a lot of control over it. Yeah. I like, uh, you should figure out what has, again, probability and outcome. If you're trying to build wealth, looking for the 10x moonshot is not the way I would do it. Yeah. Just because the odds are it's going to lose. I mean, look at the, look at the VCs. Uh, you know, they've got all these experts and all these everything, and they lose 20 or so times out of 25. And you would think they would win at least 40 or 50 percent, wouldn't you? Yeah. So what you have to do is look for high probability, high viability. I like, uh, I don't like putting all your eggs in one basket, but I think you need a, you know, a prime business. And I think as you make money, you need to look at optional ways to produce sustainable semi or pure passive income and asset appreciation that you can't screw up. If I were reliving my life, because I have a friend that did exactly this, we both were successful about the same time. I came from a very poor background and wanted things. So I had the cars, and I had the houses, and when I was single, the girls, and the everything else that goes with it. And he lived in a small house, and every year bought 10 or 20 very solid middle-class single-family homes. And he now has, I mean, he also started a mortgage company, and he invested in a technology company, and the guy's making $20 million a year, mostly passively, but he worked very hard. Uh, I'm 69, gonna be 70, and I can tell you, you don't have the, you have the wisdom that you didn't have when you're younger. You have the humility and you have the humanity, but you don't always have the energy. Nor if you have it, you don't always want to do that which you did for 40 years. So what you want to do is create an environment where you have total flexible options or optionality, and that's only possible if you have vehicles that work for you continuously. Uh, you can put other people in business. And, and I mean, I this is funny, and I'm not demeaning them. I have a lot of children from uh, uh, more marriages than I would like to admit. And they're wonderful kids. But we put them in private school, then we paid for them to go. Most of them, it was, most of them did the funny thing. They all wanted to go to state-owned schools, unfortunately not in our state. <laughs> so it cost me 50 or 60 grand to go to a school that everyone else is paying 10 plus the house, plus the car, plus the $1,000 debit account. So they all graduate with a degree that they never use, and they got to find a new thing. And we calculated that if we had bought uh, 15 subways and just gotten a manager and given them an equity in them, they'd be better off. But, I mean, think about what, again, if you're looking for uh, wealth, let's look at what it probably isn't going to be for most of us. It's not going to be something that's high tech that you don't understand that can be put uh, 
that can be put into obsolescence by the next high tech unless you really are on top of it. I mean, for everyone that that hits the the hockey stick and sells for a billion, there are so many that die. Yeah, die. And you again, advantage, probability, outcome. Look at things that are going to be a little boring, but can't be put out of business by you know, the next level by 6G or this or that, but could be helped. And I just think, I, I don't like, I've put money in deals I didn't understand, and I was minority, and most of them blew up. And my wife, uh, it's interesting, we, we went to a party a couple of weeks ago, and when I got married to my wife, I had this outrageously spectacular view home on the side of a cliff, but it wasn't conducive to children. It had no, I mean, we had acres, but they were all down. You couldn't build them. And knocking the house down and rebuilding would have made it out of market. So we sold it and bought a, uh, I, I, I had plenty of money. I could have bought, and it was a very down market, some of these really cool houses they were building on a cliff that were seven, 8,000 square feet, but they were five or 600,000 more than the very large home we bought in a lesser desirable area. So now my house that I bought for X is worth 5X. Good. But we went to a party at one of these houses that was 500 grand more, and back then it would have been, I don't know, you know, a couple thousand dollars more a month. They're worth $11 million. So if you're going to buy, don't buy on price, buy on, you know, sustainability, the probability of the neighborhood staying constant. They always say buy, uh, if it's going to be a rental or a flip, buy the least expensive home in the most expensive neighborhood. But uh, I have another client that's a big, that's a big uh, uh He's a, he's a uh, commercial real estate broker. And he makes seven figures a year, and he came to me for help growing. And it was the funniest thing in the world because upon analysis of his transaction and his wealth, 80% of his wealth has come from deals that he didn't just sell. He actually invested in with his clients. And I went to him and I said, why do you want to sell these things and make 400 grand when you've got money and we, everyone you've partnered with, you've made millions of dollars, it makes no sense. But a lot of us don't spend time to analyze, correlate, but I think you all should be deciding when, when you're done, not when you're dead and not when you're incapacitated or Alzheimer riddled, but when you're done with what you're doing, or if you don't want to have to do it, you want to continue it as a labor of love, what vehicles can you create today that aren't outside your comfort or your knowledge or just your logic? You know, if it, if it doesn't smell right, you know, it's, it doesn't mean it's not worth taking a flyer. I wish I'd bought, because I could have bought it cheap of Facebook and things like that. But if you're going to invest for wealth, invest with uh, a, a portfolio mindset and be hedged. But as I said, my recommendation, and it's just because I know a lot of, I've done a lot of technology companies and for every sales force, there's a, 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 a company like it that's struggling to do a million dollars. And try to find, okay, probability outcome. What's, again, what has more certainty? And a lot of littles can be a better hedge than a little lots. In other words, uh, <clears throat> uh, I have a, a, a colleague that I help, and he's in the, uh, he's got two different variations of a business. He's very big in uh, CRM for, martial arts, and he just started adding uh, credit card processing. 
and the credit card processing almost exceeds the money yeah. from that. However, he was talking about all these little uh, schools that are only worth 60 or $70. And we talked about the fact, yeah, but nobody wants them. If you could figure a cost-effective way that you didn't make any money in year one, but you picked up not just in martial arts, but all the, what we call the orphans nobody wants, mm -hmm. a lot of littles aggregate and you're really well hedged. If you lose 10% of them, you know, you're not gonna be killed. It'll be just an inconvenience, but it's a lot of work, but it's harder to kill. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of strategies. The first thing, again, if you're going to optimize, you need to evaluate your choices. And you can't evaluate your choices if you don't try to figure out what they are, how to get there, in other words, you might want to own a big apartment building. Well, if you own no real estate now, starting there seems to me a little dangerous. Maybe you buy every year uh, one or two houses with high enough uh, uh, equity that you won't be hurt if anything happens in the economy. Either uh, interest rates change or uh, you know, or values drop, or you have to change prices because it'll always either cash flow or break even. You, you, the, the key to there's a, a lot of trite adages, but you want to be able to come back and uh, win and market another day. Mm -hmm. And I would never, I would never, in the beginning of anything you do, take a flyer on anything that had a high speculative and a low probability. And I would look for things that weren't, that were enduring. In other words, uh, we were, we were, uh, we have a, a, a big house, but it's old and every, it's 30 years old and everything is breaking and all the paint's worn out, it's like a body. And we had this wonderful painter who's been with us for, oh, 20 years and his family and his son just came in and he said his son wanted to learn, uh, is you know a skill and I said to him well the one thing is I don't think that technology is going to put you out of business it might give you tools yeah but you, you know it may maybe they'll be able to bring a machine and it'll just do it but it's improbable for a long time you want to look at what is not going to uh, make it obsolete and there's always going to be innovation, there's always going to be consolidation, there's always going to be uh, alternative ways of providing it, but what has endurability? And, and what has optimally, what has uh, sustainability in any kind of a scenario? Uh, what I like about uh, single family homes, just me, is that in a good market, uh, when people can't afford a house, they go there. No. Uh, a lot of, of millennials don't want to own anything. No. In a bad market, when people are losing their house, they go there. Now, it's a little bit of a, a tragedy, but you're looking at probability and outcome. So to me, you, you allocate every year what I call a wealth investment. And I can't talk about uh, about uh, stocks in the market because I've never been good at it. I will tell you that I gave my wife a uh, uh, hundred grand about eighteen months ago, and currently she has five hundred, but she could easily have ninety. I took from a client uh, about a year ago forty five or fifty thousand dollars of of not Bitcoin but Ethereum. Mm -hmm. which is worth about $15,000 today. <laughs> so I don't like passive things I can't control, but I like assets that I know can be controlled by a management mm -hmm. to produce passive income. I, I'm not explaining it well, but does that help? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me give you guys some, some translations of some things if it's cool. Um, I think, well, Dean Jackson's the one who told this to me. He's, he's an amazing marketer out there. And I don't know what his philosophy is. Is it similar? 
Yeah, he probably learned it from you. I don't know, but um, it's about the oak tree. When okay. when do you want to plant an oak tree? Oh, right. Either, when you can afford it. Yeah, when you can afford it. Not when or, the sky's falling. Or 25 years ago or today, right? There's a couple times when to plant an oak tree. And I think uh, wealth is, you know, planting the seed first for you. The other thing, I'm going to give you two things that I, I believe helped me by connecting a lot of people, uh, pieces from great things that Jay has given me over the years, Tony Robbins, all these guys. Rob and I spent time with Kevin O'Leary and these guys. Uh, one, be on a mission. Write that down. I'm not talking about a mission statement. I'm like, be on a mission and love the mission. Like, love the mission that you're on. For me, we're really clear at CEO Warrior. Our mission is not just to help business owners. This is a stepping stone to removing suffering from the planet. We understand that. If I can remove suffering from some of you, you will remove over time suffering from others and maybe your family has suffering. So, so the fact of us removing suffering from the planet is the big picture. Next thing, someone told me, and I wish I could remember who, it's probably, it's right before we started uh, CEO Warrior, they said create a movement. And a movement is in the service industry. We had a movement at Gold Medal. And, and we had a mission. We knew what we were doing. And we loved the mission. So if you look at Create the Movement, that's why if you notice everything in CEO Warrior now is Warrior Global. The third part, and you should write this down, live both of them. You have to live it. Very few of you probably ever see me wear anything different the last five years than a CEO Warrior shirt. Not because it's marketing. I can market on Facebook. It's because I'm reminded every day to live within that mission and within that movement. It's my reminder for me. The other thing which I, I take away from Jay is, think about leveraging, leveraging things. You know, you don't need a million dollars to, to win. No. You could have a couple dollars to win. And if you can think about leveraging, when you don't, I always meet a business owner who tells me, yeah, I'm successful and I have no debt. And I'm like, well, how much successful would you be if you had some debt? Yeah. You know, that's that poverty mindset. I, I have no debt, and then the leveraging mindset that you hear of these guys out there at Shark Tank, well, people, smart people say, yeah, I'm gonna leverage that in, the, in a smart way. The other thing is, you know, which I, I wanna go to this next, because Jay's the best in the world at this, how to take assets and create them into opportunities. Like I was telling him about this building when we got it, and he, he started just going on this thing, well, what do you do about the parking lot when it's not used? And what do you do about in the building when nobody's there? And what happens during nighttime? And I'm like, holy shit, I never even thought about this. Half of it I haven't even put in place. But will you talk about underutilized assets they have in their business? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, let me start with two parallel universes. Uh, probably some of the most... Uh, Valuable assets you have are intangible and are not recognized. They can be everything from uh, relationships, skill sets, uh, processes, procedures, distribution channels, methodology, IP, uh, and I'll come back and give you examples of this. But uh, let me start with another track that is related but different. So many people in life believe that they can't grow because of lack of capital. Mm -hmm. And my attitude is you have access to infinite capital almost totally and entirely and at your will in a way where you have an unlimited checkbook and you don't have to write any check that gets cashed until it produces a profit if you understand it. And let me give you a couple of simple examples. Uh, the best one I'm, I'm the proudest of because it's so cute and profitable. I was in China 15 years ago the first time and there were eight, 900 people. There was a really uh, intense seminar and I did Q&A through translation. And a young man came up to the mic and said, what do you do, it's through translation, what do you do if you're too small and the bank won't lend you money to grow? And the first thing I always say is, well, if you had the money, what would you do with it? Yeah. Because people want the money, but it's really what they want is what the money will buy. And 
He said, I'm a small local motorcycle manufacturer. Now, only in a this place like China where they have 100 million, uh -huh. would you be a local motorcycle? And he said, if I had the money, I'd go all over Asia, I'd form a factory, I would hire, uh, I would get offices in different countries, salespeople, distributors, and then dealers. And I said, okay, so why do you need the money? He goes, I just told you. I said, you don't need the money. What you have to realize is your problem is always going to be the solution to somebody's bigger one who doesn't necessarily know they have it. I said, go all over Asia and find somebody in a non-competitive, uh, 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 compatible, it's not the word I want to use, but compatible business who's got a huge factory underutilized, who's already got salespeople, distribution, everything, but they're limited. Maybe it's seasonal, maybe it's one category product, and make a deal with them. And I told him I'd make the deal. That took how long? Two minutes? Yeah. A year later, I came back, same guys there, 18 months, and he's at the mic, and he looks like the Cheshire Cat. <laughs> and he says, Jay, I did what you said. And I do Q&A, problem solving, opportunity mining all over the world through distribution. I mean, my typical day, that's what I do. I didn't remember it, so he repeated it. And I said, that's cool, what'd you do? How did it happen? He said, I went to all over Asia in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I found the, the Asia's largest lawnmower manufacturer. They had a second shift that was underutilized. We made a deal, I brought the tools and dies. They basically provided <coughs> the, the, the staff. I had to train them and manage it. They already had salespeople, offices, thousands of uh, lawnmower dealers, and he said in our first year together, we made $10 million profit each for a zero, real, I mean, for investment. So you have to realize that uh, I'm very good at leveraging other people's resources and assets, and there's lots of ways to do it. There's lots of ways to do it. Uh, uh, I talked about internal. You might have a process, once you figure out the marketing, that's so good that you can partner with other people outside your field and get a piece of it. We've done that with hundreds of people. You might have a way of, uh, of upgrading sales. Well, I'll give you two, other, two examples. We had a, a car wash guy years ago who had mastered a method of upgrading to the premium car wash package that was something like five times uh, more frequent than whatever the average was, and he was making an extra 20 grand a month from that. The only problem is his market is about three mile radius. Anybody else outside that, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's uh, useless. So, we got him to go to all the other car washes in North America and offered to li license this for them for $200 a month. He got 1000 So he's making twenty grand himself, but he's making two hundred grand a month licensing it. I had a client that had a... Um, I'm going to give you a lot of these. I had a client, this is your fun, fun, fun that had a uh, lumber mill, and he was a fanatic about kiln drying. And kiln drying is the biggest expense and the biggest uh, uh, outcome factor in taking timber and, and converting it, because it can turn, <clears throat> it can get warped, it can get uh, overburnt under, uh, it, it's just a lot of things, and the difference between AA, BCT grade uh, lumber is profound. Well, he was great at producing the least amount of waste, the highest uh, category uh, levels, and the lowest energy cost, which is the highest single expense in the deal. The problem was he could give the lumber away, but after about 1,200 miles, it's more expensive for shipping. So we drew a line, and at past that, we taught every lumber mill who would pay for 25 grand a year and he did it all over the country. He was making millions of dollars teaching him his same system. And every time he upgraded, it was a 5,000. It was always a multiple of what it would make him. It was a $5,000 upgrade. Uh, 
Uh, if you think about it, just for references, uh, we all talk about how brilliant uh, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, founders were and uh, uh, Bill Gates, what they did, their brilliance wasn't really in creating anything. They bought it, flipped it, but didn't sell it outright. Yeah. People don't know, everyone talks, and you may be too old now, Howard Hughes' dad is the guy that made all the wealth. Howard Hughes pissed away more. He just had a, a, a regenerative money machine that he couldn't outspend, but his dad created a drilling bit that was so uh, great that he would never sell it. He would just lease it by the job. So you could never buy it. And that was the sense of, of that. There was a guy in, um, pretty cool, there was a guy in Northern California, and this is really cool, uh, who loved Porsche automobiles. I don't know if all of you love them or if some of you have them, but he could never afford them, but he loved them. And he found out that a smaller dealership in one of the smaller cities was coming up for sale, but it needed a million dollars to you know to close the deal and operating capital, and he couldn't even afford. He couldn't. Um, I don't want to talk too fast. He couldn't even afford the uh, the Porsche. But he went ahead and he got the papers on it and the prospectus, and he went to the you know to the uh, national to get all the rules and regs, and he perused them, and he found uh, <clears throat> not a a catch, but he found a provision that he interpreted different than anyone else had, but he was legally correct. You can put a brand new car out, <clears throat> excuse me, as a demo. Right. It can be driven, I don't know if it's still the law, for three, three months or 3,000 miles and be put back into inventory as new and sold at a slight discount. Hmm. With that piece of knowledge, he ran ads all over Northern California that said, drive a brand new Porsche every year for life for a one-time investment of $75,000. He got 200 plus people wow. to do it. Now, here's the cool thing. It wasn't debt, it wasn't equity. They got the right to do this. But what happened were three things. One, half of them didn't do it all the time, breakage. Half of them bought the car. All of them became great, great referrers and and non-compensated salespeople. He got the money for the dealership plus another million dollars or so for operating capital. Zero payback, zero interest, zero equity. I mean, that kind of stuff, is that the kind of things you want me to talk about? Yeah, yeah, and let me give you guys some to think about for your company. Here's, here's a couple I thought over the years. We grew fast, we didn't need to do it. But how many of you, uh, I'm sure there's some in the room, wanted a salesperson, but you're not sure if you had enough work to give a salesperson, that ever happened? Okay, some of you. So imagine if, and those of you that have, who has teams of salespeople, anybody? Imagine if those teams of salespeople that you also did sales for other companies when you didn't have sales for them, and the company took a cut, but you're also feeding the guy. Is that a great possibility? One of the other things Rob and I was gonna do was our call center, why not answer phones for other companies? Yep. And then if you notice there was such a demand coming in a call center, maybe you'll decide to do That's great. That, yep. that service. Uh, home shows, who does home show street fairs, anything like that? What about if you also offered additional services that were uh, not the same as you, but something a customer wants? So let's say windows and doors or something, and you don't do that, and everybody who bought from that, you took a percentage cut of that. I mean, that could be a really good possibility. And I think a really good one, like how many of you have parts, who has parts runners in here or something? Some of you, oh, some of you don't have parts runners? Wow, that's just a weird thing. Uh, but if you have a parts runner, maybe you don't because you don't know this strategy. When we had a parts runner and stuff, like if you have a parts runner, you're like, well, what does he do when he's not working? Well, you stick his ass in some kind of sign truck and you drive it all around the demographic area. You know, we had a sign truck and we drove it and we told them always be kind, but they had it, they would take a part in New Jersey, drive around, they would beep at our competitors and wave kindly to them. And everywhere the radio station was at, every diner, the guy would pull into the diner and get a 
bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. And because if they're there, they're going to see that stuff. So if you could just start to think of what Jay is thinking about here. What about uh, who's in the HVAC business? Okay, so you guys are like me. You're yanking back all the scrap, and you're hoping your guy didn't steal it. You're hoping it doesn't get stolen by the backyard, like gold medal around the corner. Well, what if you had a guy that came, gave you top dollar, picked it up at the job, and the reason why he would give you top dollar is because that guy, hopefully uh, Dave Lewis is on. Dave Lewis runs a rubbish company. Uh, he's a centurion warrior in New Zealand. Uh, if he went and picked up our garbage, what if then he asked the customer, is there additional stuff that you've been wanting to get rid of? Now that is a benefit for us, mm -hmm. we get paid, it's a, it's a loss leader or a new leader for him. Do you see, are you starting to understand wealth in a different way? That there's streams of it everywhere, but you're just in your little bubble. So what I want Jay to do, just for about five minutes or so, is tie a ribbon around this, and then I'm gonna get Jay out of here tonight because he's gonna come back tomorrow. Who's excited to see Jay again tomorrow? Okay, awesome. Okay. So can I add a couple yeah, things? Absolutely. So uh, to show you the spectrum of interpretation, and if you call my office, we had somebody uh, create a document, 100 OPRs, other people's resources you could access. And it's a little, some of it's funny, but it's pretty cool. Uh, you talk about uh, your parts truck. We had a client that was in the um, the uh, delivery, the pickup and delivery of from hospital of uh, specimens, urine samples, blood, etc. And that's a very time critical thing. But once they've delivered it, they're dead in it, right? Until they go pick more up. We went to a bunch of the regular non-critical time delivery services and their problems are they have the own the trucks they have the insurance they have the dispatch they have the drivers we already had all that we just had empty coming back we said why don't we take over all your deliveries we can eliminate 90 percent of your overhead and we'll split and we consolidated two or three of them and we made more money from the back end mm. than we did the first you're talking about something else i was one of i mean i go back 40 years i was one of the first people to figure out the loss leader uh tune-up concept in your industry yep. and we did it uh back in the uh early 80s or late 90s and I had one company that was the largest in Dallas and they were killing it it was working so well that they couldn't handle all the calls but they didn't want <coughs> to invest in more trucks or people mm -hmm. and he thought he had to throttle it down I said well there is another approach find a company that has integrity but is very much underutilizing give them magnetic signs with your name on it, give them your uniforms and pay them over because we already had the, we had the metric to know that every $29 made us whatever, right. 2000 And I said, well, just let them be extensions of us. And we did it instead of spending $5 million yeah. on people. But I mean, there's all kinds mm. of inventive ways to do that. Uh, one of the most wonderful things, and this is, uh, it's it's pretty cool. It, do, do do all of you know how uh, AARP got started? Mm. You all know what it is? Mm. Most of you do? Okay. So years ago, a company called Colonial Pen uh, was created with a high focus on group type selling. And they were struggling. And they were not doing well, and it was they weren't breaking into a lot of groups. And after a couple of years, one of the new directors said, "Well, let's rethink this. If we can't penetrate a group, why don't we start our own so we have a captive client?" And they started AARP so they would have a client, which is pretty interesting. Uh, uh, I've had. Well, I'll tell you another story. We had. Uh, two clients in Australia, well three, that were really interesting. One, early in the game of CRM, 
he was selling very expensive CRM for entrepreneurs, and they were about 50 grand back then, a long time ago. And he was running every trade magazine. He was getting um, about 1,000 leads and was closing 3%. And the first thing I said was, so you are, you're spending 97%, and I think he was spending 100 grand a month, uh, roughly, for the story it works, whether it, 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 the indication is the same. 900, excuse me, 97,000 was being wasted, right? Mm -hmm. 3,000 was making him money, and the other 97 was being wasted. And I said, well, most of those people, I mean, a CRM system isn't that exciting. So if they're inquiring, it's probably because they want one. It's just that yours is either too expensive, you don't have good terms, too many bells and whistles, not good financing. Why don't you go out and find somebody who's got a great basic system but can't market their way out of a paper bag, get the rights to it, at least in your markets, and then and then put some bells and whistles on and give that person 5% because a royalty is probably going to make them more than they're selling. And we started downselling for five grand, and it became the profit, and the other became the lead. The 50000 was the lead, to get it was the vehicle that got the lead in the contrast between 5000 and 50 but we were able after a year or two to upgrade half the people mm -hmm. i mean it was just amazing and i have a whole course on this that you've gotten before relational capital yeah. Yeah. and i have no problem with your high end people if you wish to give that to them if you haven't awesome. and if they do i'll have to give you a context of how to use it or they'll get daunted but I've done billions of dollars using other people's resources and paying on the, uh, you know, on the uh, results. Uh, and I've bought uh, the rights to things. I mean, I could tell you stories that will just boggle your mind, but the point is you can't appreciate, you gotta appreciate two things. Almost anything you want that you don't think you can afford, whether it's other offices, whether it's, uh, uh, storage, whether it's equipment, whether it's uh, manpower, whether it's expertise, technical, you can acquire if you can prove results by converting it to a share of profit, sales, savings, number one. You need to know how to metric it. Yeah. Number two, if you can't get someone to provide it on a payout if you can metric it and analyze its annual yield you can get an investor so let's say that you figured out that if you could run uh, uh, $50,000 worth of ads a month for a, a $49 tune-up and you did it right that 50 is going to make you in, in, in the first year uh, 400 grand each 50 yeah. or whatever it is but the yield on it is what uh the gross yield like my brain doesn't matter but let's say the yield is net uh 80 mm percent -hmm. well do you think there aren't investors out there that wouldn't put the money out for the first you know first money's back no, of course they wouldn't i mean you just have to look at i mean you you, you have unlimited availability to do anything you want you just have to be open-minded and not conventional is that what you wanted me to say that's awesome that's awesome this has been another powerful business building episode of the CEO warrior podcast show with your host business warrior mike aguilero do you want to get the warrior blueprint to grow in your business check out service business edge at servicebusinessedge.com